Section 1. Moral Effluvia During an epoch of triumphant reaction, Messieurs Democrats, Social Democrats, Anarchists, and other representatives of the left camp begin to exude double their usual amount of moral effluvia, similar to persons who perspire doubly in fear. Paraphrasing the Ten Commandments or the Sermon on the Mount, these moralists address themselves not so much to triumphant reaction as to those revolutionists suffering under its persecution, who with their excesses and amoral principles provoke reaction and give it moral justification. Moreover, they prescribe a simple but certain means of avoiding reaction. It is necessary only to strive and morally to regenerate oneself. Free samples of moral perfection for those desirous are furnished by all interested editorial offices. The class basis of this false and pompous sermon is the intellectual petty bourgeoisie, the political basis, their impotence and confusion in the face of approaching reaction. Psychological basis, their effort at overcoming the feeling of their own inferiority through masquerading in the beard of a prophet. A moralizing Philistine's favorite method is the lumping of reaction's conduct with that of revolution. He achieves success in this device through recourse to formal analogies. To him, Tsarism and Bolshevism are twins. Twins are likewise discovered in fascism and communism. An inventory is compiled of the common features in Catholicism, or more specifically, Jesuitism and Bolshevism. Hitler and Mussolini, utilizing from their side exactly the same method, disclose that liberalism, democracy, and Bolshevism represent merely different manifestations of one and the same evil. The conception that Stalinism and Trotskyism are essentially one and the same now enjoys a joint approval of liberals, democrats, devout catholics, idealists, pragmatists, and anarchists. If the Stalinists are unable to adhere to this people's front, then it is only because they are accidentally occupied with the extermination of the Trotskyists. The fundamental feature of these approachments and similitudes lies in their completely ignoring the material foundation of the various currents, that is, their class nature, and by that token, their objective historical role. Instead, they evaluate and classify different currents according to some external and secondary manifestation, most often according to their relation to one or another abstract principle which, for the given classifier, has a special professional value. Thus, to the Roman Pope, Freemasons and Darwinists, Marxists and Anarchists, are twins because all of them sacrilegiously deny the Immaculate Conception. To Hitler, liberalism and Marxism are twins because they ignore blood and honor. To a Democrat, fascism and Bolshevism are twins because they do not bow before universal suffrage, and so forth. Undoubtedly, the currents grouped above have certain common features, but the gist of the matter lies in the fact that the evolution of mankind exhausts itself neither by universal suffrage, nor by blood and honor, nor by the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. The historical process signifies primarily the class struggle. Moreover, different classes in the name of different aims may in certain times utilize similar means. Essentially, it cannot be otherwise. Armies in combat are always more or less symmetrical. Were there nothing in common in their methods of struggle, they could not inflict blows upon each other. If an ignorant peasant or shopkeeper, understanding neither the origin nor the sense of the struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, discovers himself between two fires, he will consider both belligerent camps with equal hatred. And who are all these democratic moralists, idealists of intermediary layers, who have fallen, or are in fear of falling, between the two fires? The chief traits of the prophets of this type are alienism to the great historical movements, 
a hardened conservative mentality, smug narrowness, and a most primitive political cowardice. More than anything, moralists wish that history should leave them in peace with their petty books, little magazines, subscribers, common sense, and moral copybooks. But history does not leave them in peace. It cuffs them now from the left, now from the right. Clearly, revolution and reaction, czarism and Bolshevism, communism and fascism, Stalinism and Trotskyism are all twins. Whoever doubts this may feel the symmetrical skull bumps upon the right and left sides of these very moralists.